Hey everybody, Awesome Edgy here, and today is another novel idea video where we're going to be covering uh, Cibola Burn by James S.A. Corey. Uh, and this is the fourth book in the Expanse series. And with us again, like all the other books, we have Caprices joining us. Hi. So, uh, just to get started again, uh, it's been a while since we've done one of these. Primarily, we, we were supposed to do Stone of Tears in April uh, with, uh, with Nap, but uh, he had to move. <laughs> so, he's still dealing with moving to a new location and all that good stuff. So, once he gets settled over there, we're going to record that and get that going. So, that's going to get moved back a little bit. But in the meantime, we wanted to go ahead and move forward with this one. Uh, and again, just a forewarning, if you have not read the book, uh, this is going to contain spoilers, so if you don't want to hear any spoilers to the story, uh, or any of the previous books, then uh, definitely stop the video here and go and read the book first. So, your thoughts on the book, considering the most recent book you weren't <laughs> super hot on. Yeah, Abaddon's Gate, definitely. That, but I still attest that was my own fault. Um, I definitely came into this book being very hesitant. I wasn't sure. I I wasn't sure if I would like it, and I was worried that I wouldn't. But I absolutely loved it, and in fact, it reminded me a lot of when I read *Leviathan Wakes* and um, *Caliban's War*, where I, it was a page turner for me. I think I read it in two and a half days total. Um, which is really fast for you. Yeah, I'm a slow reader. <laughs> um, but it was just so good. I, I found myself doing the same thing where I was like, just one more chapter. And it wasn't even because the chapters really left on cliffhangers the way they tended to do in, um, like, say, Leviathan's Wake. Um, it was just, I really, really enjoyed the story, which is kind of funny because I was looking it up for different reasons. And I feel like a lot of people either really loved this book or really hated it. They didn't enjoy it. And I'm like, I loved it. Like, I, I don't know. I can see why. <clears throat> I mean, I didn't read anything that you did. Mm -hmm. But I can, just out of my <clears throat> personal experience with stuff like this in the past, I can see why some people may dislike the book. And it's probably more due to the fact that there's less, uh, there's less spaceship, less outer space stuff going on because the like, shoot, more than half the book takes, takes place on the surface of a planet. Well, the, the, the biggest... Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to say it. The, what everyone started comparing it to is it was like Western. Because you have colonists coming in and frontiering the land, basically, sort of thing. Okay. And that's where the conflict comes from. So instead of it being very space opera-ish, it took a turn to be more of like a Western-type theme, I suppose. If you want to put it in words. I can kind of see that. Yeah, I get the comparison, but I don't think it's super accurate. No, I don't, because I mean, every, I mean, saying Western puts a lot of like, hey there, cowboy, yeah, you know, into and it, it. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, even if there's a little bit of it that is quote unquote Western-ish, you and I both like Westerns. Right. So it's, that may be why we don't see it as a Western, even though we still enjoy it. I, I don't know. Like I said, I personally just thought the story was really exciting. And it reminded me, I keep saying it, but it did remind me a lot of like when I was reading the first, uh, you know, Leviathan uh, Wakes. Leviathan's Wake? No, Leviathan, Leviathan Wakes. Wakes. Um, when I was reading the first book where you're having this sort of like driving force of like, oh my God, are they going to make it? And what's going to happen with, you know, the protomolecule and, you know, error. Eros? Eros? Eros. Eros, you know, careening through and just, it, it felt like that to me. And... It was very... Once once it got to the point where they did something to piss off the, the planet, basically, mm -hmm. and the moons went active and, sh and shut down all the ships in orbit, and then that thing exploded on the other side of the planet... Mm -hmm. that created that huge tsunami slash like dirt wave mm -hmm. that started that point at that point when they were describing it from the Rosinante and they were like oh my god holy shit look what that is and then they were quick like oh my god get holding on the phone right 
You know, they need to be aware of this because it's coming right at them. Well, see, I will say this is that I remember being 10 chapters in and asking you, I was like, it's still not, uh, those first, like, say, 10 or so chapters, there's a lot of its exposition of, okay, this is where we're at. We're inside the ring. We're in a planet. This is kind of what's been going on. We need, we need the catalyst to get hold into the planet because, of course, he wasn't there. So there's a lot of setup. And I remember asking you, I was like, does it get more exciting? And I'm, I'm wondering if a lot of people that didn't like the book maybe stopped reading before it got to the point that it was really exciting. Or, did, you know, it was exciting for me, I guess. It did take a little while to, quote unquote, <laughs> get started. But you also have to look, in it, look at it from the aspect of the first, the first two books, basically, were very action packed the entire length of the book. Mm -hmm. But most books aren't like that. There's a right. big, there's a chunk of setup in the beginning where it's like, okay, look, this part's going to be a little duller than you're expecting because we have to, we have to set up where you are, where you're going, what you're going to do, well, why you're going there. Then we can get into the action. And, and I, a lot of people get put off by that. Yeah. And I really appreciated that in this book once I got to the more actiony part because I think if you had just been thrown into the action, you would have been like, okay, but where are we? And why are we here? So you would have had all of those exactly. questions. You would have been all like, well, what is this planet that we're on? Right. Why Why did we blow up a, uh, uh, a spaceport, you know? Right. And it's like, those are answered in the first couple of chapters, and they play vital roles throughout the entirety of the book. Well, yeah, it really shapes the characters that you're interacting with and dealing with. Yeah. So, I like I said, I really enjoyed this book. It, it starts out a little slow, just setting everything up. But once it hits its stride, it really never stops running. Oh, no. It takes off, and it's just like a full sprint all the yeah. way to the end. And that <clears throat> that is just... It was what great. I, I think it's kind of what I missed in Abaddon's Gate that I didn't lock didn't into. Feel. Yeah, I didn't feel that. And in this one, I'm super excited now to go in and read uh, Nemesis games because I'm coming off of this, like, high of an amazing book. So. Yeah. There's there's a lot of good stuff in this book. <laughs> yeah. There's um, one of the things I mentioned to you the other day that, that really stuck with me. Again, I have the weirdest things stick with me mm -hmm. in books. But when they're... Uh, when the Rosinante and the uh, the Edward Israel are are falling into the uh, the orbit, mm -hmm. or falling out of orbit into the planet, um, one of the parts I thought was really ingenious was when they were using the giant rail gun that they had taken off of the. Uh, uh, Rosinante. No, they took it off of the other ship that became the space station in the middle of oh, the. Oh, oh, right, the the, the, the behemoth. It. Yeah, they took it off of the behemoth. Well, technically. Well, yeah, because it was the behemoth, because it was the Novu, and it was then the it became Nauvoo, the then behemoth. Then it was the behemoth, and now it's something else, because now it's a space. It's, it's a station. Oh, God, I forget the and name, and I don't remember the name of it. But, but it's, it it's okay. They mention it in the book. They're like, it keeps changing its name. Like, how are we ever supposed to remember what it is? Yeah, but they they took the rail gun off of the behemoth mm -hmm. and stuck it on the Rosinante, and they were using the rail gun as. Uh, kind of pseudo propulsion. They they weren't going to use it to like get back into orbit, but at least they could slow their descent with well, it. Well, it was buying them yeah, time. Yeah, the, the little bit of additional time that they needed, it was going to help them with that. They had, yeah. a, they had a clock up and running of how, <laughs> when impact would happen, basically. Like, T-minus this much time till impact uh, and them dying. And every time they used the railgun, time was added back into it. So yeah. instead, instead of it being like, okay, we're going to die in, you know, an hour, now it's an hour and five minutes. So it was definitely working. Oh yeah, it was just really, really slow, and yeah. they and they couldn't use it endlessly. No, that it, yeah, it wasn't like they could just endlessly do it. They, there was a downtime. Yeah. So, at a certain point, you're just basically moving you're, almost you're like laterally. The you're, yeah, you're just yeah, you're not really giving yourself big chunks of time. You're just kind of breaking even. So you're going like, okay, well we had an hour, now we're at 55 minutes. Okay, now we're back at an hour. So you're just kind of going back. Yeah. to what you were. But yeah, it's funny because you were like, wasn't that part great? And I was like, well, yeah, but that's not really the part I focused on. So we tend to focus on different things. I, I focus think. more on details. Yeah, you're I very detail-oriented. I mean, I like the overall story, 
don't get me wrong, but the, the things that tend to stick in my mind are the, are the individual details that I find the coolest. I think I more connect with characters, but I don't think that's probably surprising with my psychology background that I'm, I get more um, enthralled with certain characters and their motives and I, de- I, get, I develop more feelings about them and opinions about that. I mean, I'm connected to the Rosinante crew, mm-hmm. but yeah, like the new characters that they introduce, mm-hmm. like, well, he's not a new character, but Basia being a quote-unquote main character in this story as opposed to, uh, uh, what was the second one? Oh. Caliban's War. Yeah, as opposed to being in Caliban's War, where Bossio was in that book, oh, I'm sorry. but he wasn't a main character. Total brain fart. I was like, the second one, the second person? <laughs> no. Uh, no, the second book. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, <clears throat> you know, he, he was an interesting character in that book, but in this book, it was very... Obviously, he was much more of a main character, and I thought his character was really cool, but I tend to latch on to what the character did as opposed to the character himself. Well, see, I actually really liked Bossia. And I I looked at it as being like everything he did was driven because of the loss of Katoa. And or in my opinion, the anticipated loss of his daughter. Right. Well, not no, not just his daughter. At his core, all he wanted to do was protect his family. So, I mean, they were they escaped Ganymede and he left his son behind. And he always blamed himself for the death of his son. They floated in in space for I think it was like either like a year or a year and a half because they were Ill- they were illegal they could not dock anywhere so they finally found a place that they could call home that he could then reroute his family and now suddenly the UN is like no this planet you know definitely doesn't belong to you even though you've been there for a long time and you've set up a colony it belongs to us yeah and you need to leave <clears throat> and it's threatening his family again so it doesn't surprise me he got caught up in the rebels and he was the one that blew up the landing pad and it caused the death and destruction and all of these things because everything he did was driven by i want to protect my family even if what he did wasn't the smartest decision looking at it from you know a third party point of view like he really went about it wrong but that's what drove him and I got I really really liked him as a character and I really liked getting to flesh him out more because I agree in in Caliban's war you really you only meet him for a short time um, but I, I, I think they did a really good job with his character and giving him motives and things yeah although I did not feel that way about um, LV who was another point of view character in this. What do you mean by that? I feel like I didn't... I mean, I kind of feel like she wasn't fleshed out very well. In my opinion, she felt like a secondary character that got point of view, like... I don't even know how to put it. I feel like... She was very one-dimensional. She was a scientist. She was, you know, horny for uh, Holden, but it turned out it wasn't really, like, she wasn't really in love with him. It was just she needed sex in general, and I, I just don't feel like there was anything to her. Like, I, I, it's not that I didn't enjoy reading her chapters or whatever, but I felt no connection. It wasn't like, you know, with, like, Anna in in previous book where it was you know you really get to know Abaddon's gate yeah you really get to know Anna um, and you just latch on to this really fleshed out wonderful character who is has such a great personality and such a spitfire and such so headstrong and then you have Elvi who is just a scientist and the only thing they ever talk about for like half of her character thing is that she is in love with Holden. She just met him, but she's in love with him. And I just couldn't connect to that. See, that's weird that you say that because I think because I have I have come to think of the authors as so good at building characters and building a, a really detail, intricate universe to live in that when LV was... And I agree with you that LV feels Mm one-dimensional, but I feel like it was more... It was intentionally that way by the authors. Like, they wanted the character to be kind of dull and boring, and that's just who she was. And yeah, she she needed 
she she had that lust for Holden, mm-hmm. but it just came down to she hadn't been laid in a long time. Yeah. Well, it's not that I disliked her. It's just that when I was, you know, in my mind comparing, and I, I guess you really can't do that, comparing someone like Bossia's character that really was very intri- was very intricate, and then you have Elvie who was more one-dimensional. I guess I connected more with Bossia than I did with her. Yeah, but you also have to you also have to look at LV as she was technically part of the UN team that was like, you know, these colonists they don't belong here. We're gonna right. get here and we're gonna prove that, you know, they're screwing stuff up on the planet and messing with the ecology of the plant life, mm-hmm. and then we can uproot them legally because we can say they're screwing stuff up. Right. They need to leave, and so she was very much like, yeah, that's my job. I'm supposed to find how they screwed stuff up and get rid of them. So she was very, while she was kind of likable because she was somewhat interesting, she was also, she was in that weird gray area of you also didn't want her to succeed at her job. Yeah, I guess even if it was um, almost subliminal, like it wasn't necessarily that fact thrown into your face. I mean, you knew why she was there, but it wasn't something in my forethought that I thought that I shouldn't like her for but I guess that makes sense that maybe just even subconscious or unconscious your thought of I was so sort of all about Bossia and he's a colonist and this is his home and she's there to uproot him that maybe even like I said subconsciously I was like I don't like her Uh, although then we have someone like Murtry who was just easy to hate (laughs) really easy to hate he's up there with uh Oh, I know who... Are you talking about... It's one of two people, and now I can't remember either of the names. Either you're talking about uh, the... The dude from the first book. Yeah, the one that was on the the, the little planet or whatever. Yeah, the little asteroid <laughs> station <laughs> I know thing exactly who you're trying book. to say, and I can't remember his name. The dude where they interviewed him, and then Miller ended up shooting him in the face at the end of the interview. Yes, let me see if I can Google that real quick, but you can talk about Mercury that, while I do I that. I forgot that guy's name, but oh my god. Yeah, Mercury was just... From the beginning, Mercury was like, this guy seems like a little bit of a hard ass. You know, at first, you're just like, okay, this guy is a strict by the book hard ass kind of dude. And then as the book went on, you're like, no, he's not a strict by the book hard ass kind of guy. He's just an asshole. <laughs> Very much. And I really wished that all the times that um, Amos wanted to kill him, that Holden had just said yes. I know. The, the, um, the part that panicked me the most in the book and you said when we talked about this you said oh yeah I wasn't worried at all no I was crapping my pants when oh mm-hmm. go ahead no did you find the name no I'm sorry I just re- I know what you're talking about yeah. I'm still looking it's hard for me to t- to think and respond and <laughs> look things up all at the same time the, uh, I only have so much brain capacity the part that you said you weren't panicked at all and I was crapping my pants over was when um uh, Murtry and Amos kind of met each other in the, uh, God, what was it? Kind of like a ruins area at the end. Yeah. Where it, you didn't get the point of view from either Amos or Murtry at that point. It switched to points of view from characters who weren't anywhere nearby, but they just heard like gunshots and stuff like that. And I was like, I know that Murtry is just unloading on Amos with his shotgun. Well, yeah, and he did it at point-blank range. Yeah, and he did it at point-blank range, and I'm like, oh my god, I swear if they kill off Amos here, I'm going to be so pissed. And then you find out later that Amos just got a couple of his fingers blown off. Uh, I guess because he was, like, trying to shield himself or something. Mm -hmm. And and stuff like that. But I was like, oh my god, no, don't kill Amos. You you thought he was dead, which was funny because I was like, nah, he's not dead. Whereas in... Caliban's war when they shoot him and it's the rubber bullets and I and was like and they shoot him in the back of the head and his face just yeah. smacks and, and I was like everywhere. I was like oh my god they killed Avis and I guess in this one I was like nah he's cool he's good he didn't die before oh um, man just as an aside the guy's name is Anthony Dresden Dresden yes that is the guy that it was very easy to hate in the first book and I definitely feel like here in this one Murtry definitely fits that role um, he's just a asshole just yeah i was glad when he got his comeuppance well i mean you know 
Holden, of course, and I've talked about this before, stays very true to his character because even when they were having the standoff and Holden starts to shoot him, all it is is meant to incapacitate him, to, to put him down, but not to kill. Yeah. Um, and I, for a moment, was really hoping Holden was going to kill him. And Murtry was very... After that scene, Murtry was very like, oh, so you're not man enough to actually kill me? Yeah. And Holden's and like... He was still an antagonistic yeah. about it. And you're just like, God, this guy, to his deathbed, is going to be an asshole about yeah. this. Yeah. It, it's just... Or to his prison cell at this point. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, yeah, the whole time you're just like, oh, my God. And then what we were just talking about before we started recording about uh, Avasarala. Yeah. I'm. It, that's the the um epilogue i guess it would be after the book either either epilogue or it's the final chapter it might be the final chapter but i always kind of feel like the final chapter is an epilogue rather than i know they always have an epilogue because the prologue is always a uh an intro of some character dying this was the the, uh, that one was the shuttle from the was the shuttle crashing was the shuttle so obviously multiple people died there right but yeah so they always have a prologue and an epilogue so this had to have been the epilogue but anyway go ahead yeah we were talking about that Avasarala is there and she's the one that gets Holden to New Terra or Illus whatever you want to call it same difference um and you find out at the end she's totally pissed because her whole reason for sending Holden there wasn't actually to create peace, which is what he did, miraculously. She wanted a war. Yeah. She knew, oh, if anyone can start a war, it's going to be Holden. Holden will go and fuck everything up, and then we'll have war, and <laughs> I'll have someone to blame, and it'll be great. He's done nothing but start <laughs> wars yes. and, and, and battles and screw crap up through mm-hmm. every single book. And then in this book, he, she's like, perfect. I need to start a war. I want somebody to go over there and screw up really bad. Let's send Holden. He's He's got to fuck this up. And then he gets over there and miraculously cleans everything up and makes everything nice and spark. Well, I mean, not nice and sparkly clean because the planet's kind of hosed now. But <laughs> Well, yeah, after the, after the tsunami. tsunami. But um, basically, Holden did fuck it up. But he fucked up what Avasarla wanted. Right. Is what he was fucking up. And I just find that so comical. Yeah, and she's, so, she's so just, like her. At the end of the book, she's just like, God damn it. Why couldn't yeah. you have just screwed it up? I've missed her. Yeah, she's, she's such awesome. an amazing character. Um, and then our last point of view character is Havelock. Yeah, that was, I was really excited yeah, to meet again. When you hear him come back, you're all like, yes, it's Havelock. And then you realize Havelock's changed a lot since the first book. I still yeah. like him. Mm-hmm. But, well, I, I mean, because he's, no he's no longer a cop on Cirrus. He's, he, or, uh, he's a uh, security officer on a ship. Well, he, he's a contract worker, so he takes yeah. different contracts. But, <laughs> but his, his attitude about the, about the universe has kind of changed a little bit, obviously. I kind of feel like Havelock always gets the short end of the stick. Yeah. He got put on series, and then he got put with Miller. Series. Sorry, I said Cirrus, didn't That's I? That's fine. They, they knew what you meant. I knew what you meant. He got put with Miller, who was obviously the worst cop there. He was an earther on a belter, you yeah, know. Yeah, on a pro- predominantly belter station. And the belters there really hated earthers oh so bad and he wasn't respected within the the security program there and then he moved into star helix which had all of its issues with um the proto molecule yeah and then now you have him here he took another contract with the edward israel this should be pretty good and easy right we're just going with we're just taking some colonists to their some scientists to to a a planet planet. we have a u.n charter we're in the we're in the right we're gonna go there it'll be fine there's not even gonna be we can just turn around and go home afterwards there's not even gonna be conflict and And right when they get there (laughs) the freaking shuttle gets blown up on descent and he's just like what the hell, man? <laughs> yeah, he always gets the short end of the stick, and you can't help but feel for the guy. And even when he was, you know, holding Naomi prisoner, it, you knew that he wasn't the one wanting to do it. You knew there was that underlying... He was fo- He was just following orders. Yes. If I could, 
I would let you out. And she understood that as well, which is why I think that it wasn't an issue when he finally at the end was like, come on, we're going back to the Rosinante, and he jumped ship and switched sides, is why he was welcomed so easily, is yeah, because she he was had like, treated her really well. Yeah, he, he, he was kind to her, he mm-hmm. talked to her while he was in, while she was in, incarcerated. Yeah. You know, and he was just like, hey, you know, I'm sorry, This I know this is kind of a dick thing, but yeah, it's, it's not me. I, I kind of yeah. have to... Fo- I'm following the rules my boss gave me. Well, he's following Murtry's orders. Yeah, and Murtry's an asshole. Yeah, and so, so he's really stuck between a rock and a hard place. What can he do? Because if he, you know, he can either, um, I suppose, mutiny, but I don't know if that's the correct word. Like, he can... I mean, yeah, we, we, you could go AWOL. Yeah. Well, okay, there you go. He, he could either do that um, or continue to stay there and have... Have Mercury just shit on everything. Yeah. And have these engineers who he's trying to train who are not fighters, who don't understand how to fight, but they weren't prepared for this. This wasn't supposed to happen. And that's why it all went to their head at the end, and they were just like, blow everything up, kill God, all the things. I hated that so much, but it made sense. It made sense that you give some hell. I've had situations where I get a little p- bit of power and I turn crazy, and I'm a nice person. Yeah. But I can't deal with any amount of power or responsibility. Authority. Author- no, no, I can't. I, I'm the. I would be the person in your chat banning everyone and being like, everyone sucks. And you're like, you can't, you can't somebody do that. Would make, somebody would make a <laughs> joke. <laughs> yeah. And you'd be all like, perma ban. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, okay. They're gone. This is why I don't think I could like, like David. I don't think I could ever be a mod in your chat, and I think I'm okay with that. Yeah. And um, that's exactly what happened to all those engineers is everything went to their head. And, you know, they had a mission and they were going to do it. They were going to blow everything up and win this little war that they had going. Yeah. But I really liked um, Havelock. And I liked that he was malleable in the fact that he tried his best to follow orders. And at a certain point, he was like, this isn't going to work. Yeah, this is just dumb. You know, Basia coming over to be the one to rescue um, Naomi. Was yeah, everybody was like, what? <laughs> was just who are you? Hilarious. And at that point, he's like, all right, dude, if they're sending this dude over, it's we're done here. Let's just go back to the Rosinante and yeah. I'll help your side now. Um, but yeah, I was really excited because the little bit I... I, and I remember saying that when I read the first book that I really liked him. You only got a small little snippet of him in in that book, but it was enough to make me go, I really like him as a person because he seems very commendable. Yeah, and he you made... He, he thinks of it now as the wrong decision because obviously he knows that his son at the time was still alive. Well, right, but, Basia, yeah. But at in that in that situation where he had no clue whether his son was dead or alive... He made the right choice. Yeah, he you made know, the only choice. Do I stay choice. here for one child and risk the rest of my entire family, or do I abandon one child and guarantee everyone else's safety? Right. And it's like, it sucks, but that's technically speaking the right decision to make. Well, that's why I said in this book, you can definitely tell his entire motive for everything he does, getting caught up in the rebels, ending up where he is, it was always to protect his family. Yeah. He thought he was doing the right thing at the time, even if in hindsight you can see that he or he can finally see that he wasn't. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I don't like I said, I just really like this book. It got really exciting when you had the tsunami and everyone had to move into the caves. And then you had the issue of blindness and you had death slugs literally touch them and you die. And. A whole colony going blind with death slugs all around. Yeah, and then you've got to find a cure yeah, for find these a... for this blindness when right. you can't see. Right, and they realize that Holden holds the cure. It's well, his cancer and his cancer drugs hold the cure. Yeah. So he's got to accept that he's going to give up his cancer drugs, which could lead to his death. Yeah. And he still does that, and you still have Murtry even being a blind asshole at this point. I mean. It gets really good really fast. Oh, yeah. And I really just enjoyed Man, when, it. Man, when that tsunami went off, mm-hmm. like when that thing blew up on the other side of the planet and it went off, that was just, right then I was like, oh my God, shit's gonna get well, real. And it all happened at once because the tsunami happened and then the, the, moon shut the down. moons shut down everyone's mm-hmm. ships. 
the, the same way it happened in the slow zone because right. it's that same sort of whatever defensive mechanism. Right. And so you have these three ships and they're orbit. all like, hey, we'll just go down there and save them. Oh, no, our ship's lost 100 percent of its capabilities. Right. We can't do anything but slowly descend to death. Yeah, exactly. Yay. So you're like, Shit. Yeah, it, it they did a really and I say they because I know it's two authors. They did an amazing job with creating this conflict that I really cared about. I really cared about all of these characters. I mean, I had already cared about everyone on the Rosinante. But they really made me care about the colonists, and I felt very helpless for them because, you know, it was a shitty situation. And it was really easy to put yourself in their shoes, even if you're like, well, I wouldn't have done what Bossia did and blew up a landing pad. But if you floated in, you know... Yeah, if you had been, if you had been stranded homeless for a year and a half... Yeah, and you and found... And finally found a home because no one else wanted it at the time. Right. And then, like, a year later, they show up and they go, by the way, we know you've been here for a year and you were homeless for a year and a half prior to that, but this planet now belongs to us because some people on the other side of the galaxy decided that it's ours and not yours. And you know they decided it was theirs because they realized the planet was rich in lithium. Yeah. That's the only it had reason stuff they, they wanted. Yeah, that's the and only all, reason they cared about the planet suddenly. Yeah, and they were like, why can't we just mine the lithium and send it to you? No, no, that's... And they're like, they, that's not good enough. They wanted the profit. Yeah, they wanted and 100%. And they're like, no, what the just, hell? You feel for these colonists. They finally found a home after all this time. And then now the home is completely destroyed. Yeah. All of their lives are in danger. The future of the planet is in danger. Everyone, everyone but at But they that still point, don't want to leave. No. Yeah, they didn't because they were given the option. Some of them left. Some of them did leave because they were like, well, the planet's trashed. Yeah, you can Let's either stay here, here and continue to try to make something of it or, or you we'll take you home yeah and, basically. They, and there was still a very good portion of them that were like no we want to stay this is our home still yeah and that's just you that know that may be part of the whole western feel that a lot of people mentioned yeah. is that you know stuff gets trashed and then other people are like no i want to stay because it's you know yeah. i want to rebuild and that's and it's it's commendable but it's yeah i'm i think at that point if i was given the choice and they're like you're going to be accepted back. You can you can go and live on a one of the planets or the moons or one of the stations or whatever. I would have been like, I'm going to go back where there's not death slugs and there's. I mean, I know they were able to shut down. Um, Miller was able to destroy whatever it was causing the moons to um, go into like kill everything mode. But um, I still don't think I would have wanted to stay there as a colonist or a scientist. Yeah, I wouldn't have. Especially since the trek to get there. I think the trek to get there is like a year or something. It's something something it's, really it's long really period long of time. It's a really long amount of time. So if you did decide, okay, I want to leave. It's, it, it'll take you at least a year for a ship to get there to come yeah, get you. Yeah, it's a crazy amount of time. Yeah. So, yeah, it, they just... I don't know. I just, like, I keep saying I don't know. But I just really like the story. And I don't... I don't know if that there's anything that I can specifically say this was exactly why. It's just the everything. Well, the you don't whole need a, thing. You don't need a reason to say this I is why I true. like something. It's it's like when people ask you, you know, you're like, I like the color purple. Why? I just I don't do. need to have yeah. a reason. I just do. It's um, it's why do you like this book? I like the book. Yeah, I felt that way about this book. And it actually makes me I think once I read Nemesis Game, because I know the there a new book is coming out. I think s later this year in the it's, fall. No, it's uh, every other one of their books has always been released in July. Okay, so I it's think? it's the summer. So yeah, it's the summer. It's coming up soon. I think that I'm going to before I read the new book, go back and read Abaddon's Gate and give it another chance. You mean before you read before Nemesis I, Games or before no, you read before, the sixth book? Before I read the sixth book, because I fully plan, plan, blah, 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 blah. I fully plan to buy the sixth book. I mean, oh, yeah. honestly, we've got all the others. Matt and I are so into the series. I own Moby copy. I own an actual physical copy of the book. We bought the the audio books. We we have bought every medium you could basically buy of these books. We've done. Yeah, and, and I, I, we've watched the show. Yeah, and I'm just, this is m my favorite book series, I think, so far. 
I'm I'm getting to I, I'm gonna hold off saying that until I I've finish not, the series. I've not read a lot though. Yeah. And in my defense, I've not read like the Dune series or the Ender series or any of those things I like think you have. See, I don't know if I would even rank this better. The only reason I rank it, I rank Dune higher than the Expanse series is nostalgia. Yeah, mainly. yeah. Don't get me wrong. But no, this this is this book has made me want to go back and reread Abaddon's Gate, which says something because I thought I would never return to that title and give it another chance. Yeah. Because there was a lot of things I really liked about Abaddon's Gate, but then there was the main was the ending I just hated. I was so disappointed in, and it made me retroactively dislike the book more and i'm like you know what i i this was so good and i'm sure nemesis games is going to be great that i want to go back and read abaddon's gate before i read the newest book the, the book six that's going to come out yeah i know they've already released the title of the book but i forgot what it was i saw it on reddit and i promptly forgot i think it's <laughs> i think name. it's nemesis something uh let's look let's just say it since we're talking about it let's see books uh, the expanse book six there's the name of it that's got to be here. Babylon's Ashes. Babylon's Ashes. Wow. You were way off. I was way off. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, well, this is the hardcover. No, go away. Amazon stuff. I don't want to look at you. This says November 1st, but I don't know if that's all versions. Maybe they're, maybe they're a little delayed. They, they may be delayed because the show just came out and they had to take extra time to write scripts for the show versus write the book. Yeah, everything says November 1st. So a little, okay. that gives me plenty of time to read Nemesis Games and go back and read Abaddon's Gate again. So yeah. I'm excited about that. And I'm excited about Babylon's Ashes because I want to get the Kindle version. I want to get an audio version. And I, want, I like soft covers just because the ones we already have are soft covers. Yeah, they're, they're, when you say paperback, a lot of people... S picture like the size of like romance novels oh, these and these are, huge. these are these are paperback but they're they're almost the size of hardback books yeah i don't think we have we don't have nemesis games just because it wasn't available in paperback when, yet. We, yeah when we bought all of these it was only in hardback yeah. at the time and i don't want to mix but i do no. i do want to get we'll get both we'll i want to get, get physical one. copies of both yeah because i just really i love the series and i want to support it but yeah yeah, well, the authors are amazing at their... It, I don't know if I mentioned this in one of the previous ones or if I've mentioned this to you before, but I read uh, an interview with one of them where they were talking about... They asked, how do you two both write this book? Mm -hmm. And they said that like they'll, they'll split up the point of view characters. Mm -hmm. They'll write an outline of how they want the story to go. And then they'll split up the point of view characters where you write all the chapters for these two characters and you I'll write all the chapters for these two characters. And then we'll just kind of interweave them and then fix any problems well, that we have. And I was like, that is ingenious. I said this when we read the first book is that it's very seamless and mm -hmm. it still has consistently been seamless where there's never a moment where I'm like, that's definitely one of the, like, you can tell this is written by a different person than this is i feel like they do a really good job where you're never really thinking this is two authors because yeah. it really just flows like it's coming from one stream of consciousness yeah and that's really great oh yeah they do an amazing job yeah at it. and that's why i'm i'm looking forward to the my to nemesis games and i'm looking forward to babylon's ashes when it comes out mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just i'm really enjoying this series yeah so am i i love it so my final thing is Read the book. Although, as a disclaimer, if you haven't read it yet, try to read an actual copy and not the audiobook. Oh, yes. They used a different narrator for this audiobook, and he's just really bad. He's, he's, <laughs> he's really bad. All of the voices either sound like Christian Bell's Batman or Christian Bell's Batman trying to do a woman voice. There were times, because I both read and listened to the audiobook, that if you weren't paying attention in the audiobook, it was hard to tell who mm -hmm. was saying because you know how they have di dialogues back and forth uh, conversations <clears throat> yeah a conversation but they won't stop after every sentence and say Havelock said this then you know Holden said this then Havelock said this they don't go back and forth saying no, who of said course it not. so they'll just have dialogue 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 for this long conversation going back and forth and with this narrator you had a hard time determining who was talking and when they when he was switching from one character to the other yeah he wasn't the greatest he was great when he was just reading 
the story, but once he started doing voice acting, it was rough. It and that was actually again I I went on Reddit and there's like mega threads of it like uh, he's like <laughs> don't don't listen to the book, read it cuz it's worth the read, but you can listen to the audiobook. It's not like it's a total deal breaker, but prepared be prepared to probably be disappointed in it. Yeah. I know I was. I was really upset. You're not disappointed in the book. You're disappointed no. in the narrator. And the narrator changed pronunciations of characters partway through. And yeah, like Carol Chiwiwi. Yeah, it was Carol Chiwiwi, and then it turned into Carol Chiwe, and then it turned back into Carol Chiwiwi. Yeah. And that really confused me. And like I said, everyone sounds like Batman. But although, if you love the way that sounds, do it. <laughs> listen, yeah, exactly. listen to the audio book. You know what I've been looking for? I've been looking for a book which, <laughs> where everyone sounds like Christian Bale's Batman. This is, boy, have we got a book for you. Yeah, I know. But right? yeah, this book is definitely worth picking up. Definitely worth reading. Um, I highly recommend it. Yeah. I recommend the entire series. I oh, mean, I do yeah, as but... well. But I'm just, like I said, I'm really excited having come from... Abaddon's Gate, where I was slightly disappointed to coming to this one and being pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I guess sort of rejuvenated back into the series and now looking super forward to Nemesis games. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. Because I was, when you when you mentioned that you were really disappointed by the last book, I was all like, I really hope this doesn't kill her enjoyment of the series. I was afraid it was, but they proved me wrong really quickly because this yeah. was just such an excellent book. So, two thumbs up. Excellent. So, yeah, that's, uh, you think that you're pretty happy with that review, though? I think I am. Okay, good. Well, in that case, that covers the, uh, the <laughs> review for this book, Cibola Burn. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you had forgotten the I name like, of it. Oh, God, I'm <laughs> terrible with book names. So, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, the next book we're going to do, uh, I'm going to try to get back with Knapp and do uh, Stone of Tears, which is the second book in the Sword of Truth series by Terry Goodkind. Uh, and we'll try to do that. I'll update the, uh, the schedule picture thing. I'll have a link for that below as well, where it shows which books I'm doing for certain months. Uh, and I'll try to update that to reflect what we're doing. But uh, yeah, I, I'm... I'm really glad. Yeah. There is one I want to throw in. Um, yeah. We talked about doing it as a bonus review, but I want to ask you guys, because you were the ones that listened to it. Matt and I both read and really loved Ready Player One. Oh, that's... I forgot and we, we were going to do that. And we talked about doing a bonus novel idea, just kind of a one-off for Ready Player One. So let us know if you're interested in that, because we both really enjoyed that book. And um, there's... I mean... There might be, uh, and just let us know in general if you're okay with bonus ones. Like I just read um, Ray Bradbury's uh, Fahrenheit 451, and I could totally do a novel idea about that. So even though it's not on the schedule, how do you guys feel about sort of one -off. bonus one-off ones every now and then? And they would be standalone books rather than series. So let us know how you feel about that. And again, give us suggestions if there's one-off books that you're like, I would love for them to do bonus ones and cover this book. Do it, because I'm always looking for new books to read. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's it for me, though. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you all next time. Bye.